And so Cody had said one time, he's like, look, you can't go into trying to motivate employees by just making everything a bonus plan. And if we hit these marks, everybody gets these bonuses. He's like, because if people were motivated by that in the same way that you are, then they would not be working for somebody. They would just own their own business. Yeah. And that was a big revelation for me where it's like, oh, you're right. Not everybody thinks like me. Not everybody's motivated the same way I am. So you kind of have to learn how to see what is it that's really going to make this person happy and make this person motivated to continually get better at their job. Right. And for some people, it's financial incentives. And for some people, it just isn't at all. Welcome to Business with Purpose. I'm your host, Molly Stillman. And this show is all about bringing you the stories behind the brands, the companies, and the small businesses that are changing the world. Each week, I get to sit down with an incredible entrepreneur, community activist, business leader, CEO, nonprofit director, or just an incredible person who is trying to make a positive impact, not only through their personal life, but also with their career. My goal is to show you, the listener, that no matter what you do, no matter where you are, you can make an impact. Well, this week is a very special week because it is one of the last official episodes of Business with Purpose before we transition over to the new name and the new brand. I'm so excited. This is really, really exciting. Next week's episode will have all the details and all the information that you will need for what the show is going to look like starting in 2023. But this week, I have a very special guest, and my guest is my husband, John Stillman. Now, John is no stranger to the podcast. He's been on the podcast many, many times, but I've never actually gotten to sit down and just interview him. And he is a business owner, and he is an incredible person. And he is one of those people that you wouldn't necessarily know uh, is really using his business for a purpose and for good, but he is. And uh, I realize that I'm his wife. And so maybe I'm a slightly biased, but I think that after you listen to this episode, you will agree with me. He really is the best. And he's also funny and he's very, very hunky. So <laughs> I know that this is going to be a really fun episode. But before we get to my conversation with my husband, John, I want to thank our partner of the show. And that is Mama Suds. I have been a longtime fan and supporter and user of Mama Suds. We use their products in our home, everything from their all-purpose household cleaner to their Castile soap to their hand soap to their, I mean, you name it, we use it. Actually, my daughter, Lily, is standing right here. Lily, do you want to just say into the microphone real quick just how much I love Mama Suds products? Like, you can be my backup here. She loves Mama Suds. (laughs) But what I love is the products are not only non-toxic they're safe my kids can use them when my kids help cleaning up the house but they actually work i love the stain stick because let's be honest my kids get their clothes uh pretty dirty but that stain stick works like a dream i want you to fall in love with mama suds too so head to mamasuds.com and use the promo code molly and that will get you 15 percent off your order that's mamasuds.com use the promo code molly for 15 percent off your order now without further ado on to my conversation with my husband, John. Well, this is a very special day because I mean, I, whoa, what just, what just happened? Stuff's falling apart. That's all right. We're not, we're not even going to edit it out because this is real. This is raw. We, we've given up. It's we've, the end. <laughs> we've given up. This is the end. No. So this is a very exciting day because um, my husband is a guest and Let's be honest, over the last six and a half years, every time you come on this show, uh, my ratings skyrocket. So, you know, I think that says something about you. Six and a half years doesn't sound right. Has it been that long? Six and a half years? Hmm. Six and a half. How about that? Years. So here we are. We are, we're not ending the podcast journey. Next week, we will, I, we will, I will announce. <laughs> the, I'm not doing anything. Yeah, no, you're not doing anything. But next week, I will announce the new name of the show and what things are going to look like going forward. But as I was kind of planning how I wanted to round out the business with purpose era, I thought, you know what, I haven't had my husband on the show to discuss his purpose. And you when I when I said that I wanted to have you on, you were just like, but I, I don't I don't have a purpose. So I disagree, but I'm I'm just I'm very excited about this. So thanks for being my guest. Yeah. Happy to see you. <laughs> Even though we just saw each other at lunch, but that's oh, okay. You know, 
It's different. It is it's a different, different here. We're, we're in a more corporate setting. I can't ever get you to uh, do anything related to my business. So if I can get you to come into my office occasionally to record a podcast, we'll take that. I, I'm moral support in your business, but mm. that's neither here nor there. All right. So this doesn't feel right to have you do the John 101 because we all know you. Um, so, but I would love for you and one of the reasons legitimately other than the fact that I just love you and you were in many ways a last resort for having on the show uh <laughs> just kidding <laughs> at first I thought maybe that's not the right phrasing she's looking for no that's that's what you meant okay no I'm just very kidding. well no 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 I understand <laughs> continue um, your thought no I um I do think it there's a lot of things that I, I really admire about you, not just because I'm your wife, but also because I love you. And I um, really do admire the way that you do business. So I want you to just give like your brief intro as to how you ended up a financial advisor whose office is in a barn. Mm -hmm. Because your route <laughs> is, to that. Is that unusual? I is that not so. how most people do it? I think so. Because your route to that considering you wanted to grow up and when you were little, you wanted to be like in the NBA. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was, I think, a brief time where you wanted to be in sports medicine. and Yeah. So, I mean, I was the size that I am now in eighth grade, yeah. basically. So everybody was like, yeah, this dude's going to be 6'8", 225. Um, and then I didn't grow anymore from that point forward. So, yeah, the NBA thing didn't work out. Yeah, but that's okay. Yeah. So uh, I did the thing that most aspiring financial advisors do, which is go to journalism school, <laughs> obviously. Uh, at that point, I wanted to be on the radio. I wanted to do either sports talk or play-by-play -play or like own a chain of radio stations, which I realize is a very different thing from play-by-play. Uh, -play. But yeah. I wanted to be in the radio world, which if you want to get into radio... Uh, it's not a very hard business to get into. It's pretty easy to get into radio. It's also really easy to get out of radio because most people in that world don't make very much money. Yeah. Um, and I realized pretty quickly that uh, being on the air was not going to be a great path to mm, a lot of fortune, let's right. say. Um, so I ended up in the sales route, which, you know, depending on where you're selling radio, uh, could be... A good career. Yeah. Not so much at a 5,000 watt community station in Chapel Hill, but you know, you're building skills that you can use yeah. in other areas of life. It, it, uh, our jobs at WCHL built grit, tenacity. <laughs> I was mainly there to find a wife. Yes. Worked out. Um, so then one of my advertisers was a financial advisor who also um, had like a side business producing radio shows for other financial advisors. So I eventually went to work for him. So that was the connection between like radio world and financial world. Uh, so I went to work for him and it turned out he was, you know, uh, not maybe the greatest person to work for. So <laughs> we, we, when I say we, uh, me and a few employees there left, started our own media company at the same time that I went on, out on my own as a financial advisor. So I was a financial advisor under him. I had some clients there. Didn't really have enough to go out on my own. But because we also had the media business on the side, that was enough that I could you know, peel off. Which was what? Like three or four months before you had Amos. Yeah. We did all that. Yeah. So there was a lot happening in late 2015. Yeah. It was a very... I remember that time just being incredibly... Uh, stressful, but was also a time where we looked at each other and we said, God is very clearly directing us in this way. And I think he's going to take care of us. And here we are all these years later. So, um, well, one little piece I think you, you left out is how you go from being in radio to suddenly being a financial advisor and not just, you know, producing or interviewing financial advisors. And just because I know this about you, you always had a knack for 
managing your finances. I think we've actually told the story on the show before, like where you just, you just are not inclined to spend money. And my favorite story that illustrates it perfectly is your senior year where you wouldn't buy a class senior class t-shirt because you didn't want to spend the $10. And then your dad gives you $10. Yep. And then I got in line the next day at school to get a t-shirt and I just couldn't do it. Couldn't pull the trigger. Took him his ten dollars back. Yeah, like so. could not even spend your father's ten dollars to buy <laughs> a story he enjoys telling to this day. Yeah, and so that you know, but when I met you, when you when we were working at CHL, you were what twenty four, twenty five, and you had already bought your first house. You'd put twenty percent down. Um, I think I I love also looking back on that time and you telling me about how when you had your best sales month ever, you went to vacuum cleaner hospital. <laughs> bought, bought a vacuum cleaner. And bought well, a really so nice my friend Benji, cleaner. I lived with three other guys. My friend Benji moved to New York to go to law school. And took his vacuum with him. Well, we still had Lucy, who was our dog. And so, well, we couldn't have a border collie husky mix that shed all over the place and not have a vacuum cleaner. So, yeah, it was a pretty crucial purchase that had to be made. But I just love that you're like, yeah, I had my best month ever. I went and took my bonus and (laughs) got a (laughs) vacuum cleaner. So needless to say. Big time adult decision. Yeah. Needless to say, just I've ever since I've known you, you have been somebody who has been a good steward of money. I would love for you to, if we've told this story again on the show previously, it's not in a time that I remember, so I'm going to have you do it anyway. So definitely nobody else remembers. Yeah, yeah. is to tell the story of just the financial stewardship lessons you learned from your grandfathers growing up, because I think it's a really powerful illustration of how by osmosis, like that is a lot of what you learned. Yep. So you have granddaddy Buck, who was a candy salesman. Did very well. So he was like your classic, you know, fought in World War II, come home, part of that whole booming economy in the 50s, American dream kind of stuff. Did really well as a candy salesman. Like he'd go around and, and it's like a broker, I guess, and sold candy to like chains of convenience stores and stuff like that. When I was a kid and he was, I guess, maybe semi-retired, not fully retired at that point, we would go to candy conventions where you have a special badge and you just walk in this room and every candy manufacturer in the country is there with samples of everything and you just go around with your bag. Can you imagine Amos going to something like that? Uh, Well, he would have diabetes by the following (laughs) Thursday. But yeah, he loves. So anyway, Buck did well, invested well. Um, So he was a good example of building wealth. Right. Um, and then Papa John, my dad's dad, sorry for the very formal names, granddaddy Buck and Papa John. So Papa John to this day, I don't know how he ever paid bills. Um, so he owned this little furniture store in Pea Ridge. If you're not familiar with Pea Ridge, there's a reason for that. And so I just don't know how he was able to sell enough furniture to send four kids to college or just like I said, pay the bills. And so he did all these odd jobs. He would deliver propane to people's houses and he repaired singer sewing machines. And this dude would not spend money on anything. Yeah. Um, if the washing machine broke, he would walk out to his shed and he would find some parts that, and they certainly weren't washing machine parts. They were just random things that he had in his shed and he would figure out how to fix the washing, washing machine with stuff that was in the, outbuilding. So uh, he just, he didn't spend money and he always figured out a way to not spend money on stuff. And so again, I I never understood the math of how he sent all four kids to Carolina. Never, never understood how those mathematics worked out, but he always made it work. Right. And then when he had a heart attack in the nineties and didn't have health insurance, they just paid the hospital like $25 $25 a month until he died. Yeah. It was the most bizarre financial system imaginable. But um, that was what I got from two very different grandfathers who interacted with money in very different ways, but both had uh, lessons, like you said, by osmosis. I never really had a conversation with either of them about money. Yeah, It's just, you know, these are kind of the principles that you learn and observe over yeah. time. 
Yeah. So this, yeah. And, and I saw that in you from the moment that we met and I just knew, I mean, there was a lot of things that were about you that were different. Um, but that was something in particular that really stuck out. What else about me was different? Go on. That's for another podcast. (laughs) That will be for the relationships and marriage series or something. I don't know. I'm very excited about that one. Anyway. So you were doing these radio shows you know, again, thinking that you were going to be in radio and you're interviewing all these advisors. And pretty quickly, you realize that these financial advisors were asking you questions about complex financial topics and things and looking for your input. And you realized, wait, actually, maybe I might be good at this and not just good at it, but you liked it. What was that process for you? Yeah. So basically, my job was interviewing financial advisors all day for a radio show that was that was their radio show airing in their market. And so like I'm the show host in Des Moines and Las Vegas and Austin, Texas, just all around the country. I'm the guy asking the questions to the financial advisor in that market. And on one hand, with, you know, maybe a third of those guys, that's how I learned the financial business. Like nobody ever sat down and taught me anything. It was just you talk to these guys, you hear their perspective, you hear how they explain things. And that's how I learned. Like I said, that was about a third of them. With the other two thirds, I remember thinking, you guys don't really seem that bright and seem to be doing pretty well. So maybe I should just do this job myself. Yeah. So you eventually got your, what I don't know, what is it called? Certification, licensing, whatever, you know, you became a financial advisor. Mm-hmm. And uh, we already talked about how you ended up going out on your own. And so fast forward many years and a pandemic happens and all of a sudden everybody's working at home and then we buy this farm and <laughs> we bought the farm and we move here and now your offices are here in our barn. You have a, we're sitting in your office right now and then right across the way is your conference room where your clients come and you meet with them there and uh, your business looks different than it did when it started. But, you know, and, and you're, business model is really unique. And so one of the things that I really wanted to kind of highlight, and I think is something that anybody listening can take away, especially if they're a business owner of some kind, is two of the things I know about you that others would say, not just me being your wife, are the unique way in which you treat your clients and how your relationships with your clients are very is very unique. Uh, in my opinion, and also I would say is is fact, and I could back that up for multiple reasons. And then two, the way you treat and look at hiring and employing people. And it's not like you have a big staff, especially on the financial side of the business. You really just employ one person. Two people. Two people. And so it's... It's a really unique approach. So let's let's talk about the client side first and how you got to that perspective. And and I'm going to give this example of like when I mean, you do, obviously you do things like Christmas parties for your clients. And, you know, yes, we've done Durham Bulls games for your clients. But I mean, you've gone to your clients funerals and, you know, oftentimes when something really tragic happens in one of your clients lives, many of your clients are you're one of the first people they contact, not just because you're the, their financial advisor, but because you're so you've shown them that you actually care. And then I I've, I've seen that on the flip side when uh we lost, you know, Elijah and Malachi back in 2018, like dozens of your clients sent us meals and flowers and cards and all kinds of things and I just remember thinking like you're their financial advisor, <laughs> but they really care about you and you in turn really care about them. So what did that process look like for you? And why was that something that you really wanted to do differently in your business? Well, you've heard, um, you had Cody Foster on the show, not too terribly long ago, within the last three or four months, I would say. Sometimes over the summer. And so um, one of the things he's said before is that done right, being a financial advisor is among the most honorable professions. Hmm. Because if you think about it, you know, if you get some kind of, medical diagnosis, you end up spending a lot of time with your doctor, your medical team, 
Like you get to know those people during that process. Yeah. Um, if you go through a divorce, you probably end up spending a lot of time with your attorney. You get pretty close to your attorney right. during that process. Um, you lose a spouse. You might spend a lot of time with other members of your family or a therapist. Mm -hmm. So you have all these different things that can happen to you in life with professionals that you interact with because you're going through that thing. But then you think about who's the person that's involved in all of those situations. Yeah, It's the financial advisor because there are financial implications to all those situations. And like you said, the relationship is just such that that's a person you want to talk to when life is happening. So I remember hearing Cody say that years ago, and I don't know if that was even a Cody original quote or if he was quoting somebody, but yeah. I thought that made a lot of sense. And so I just always try to keep that in mind. And so a lot of times I would say more times than not uh, with most of my clients, like here's an example, just this morning, the morning we are recording this show, um, I'd had a conversation with one of my clients who, you know, her daughter is getting married and she's just like, you know, she doesn't really have a lot that she can put toward the wedding, but her daughter wants all this stuff for the wedding and she's just like stressing out over it. And, you know, she's, she thinks the stuff her daughter wants is unreasonable. And, um, she's trying to get me to help her figure out where the money is going to come from. And what our, our conversation ended up being was really not about the money. It was about, let's think about how you're approaching this mentally. I was saying, look, you're trying to approach this logically. You're just trying to assign logic to her thought process as a soon to be married 20 something year old. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's not a logical process. So you just got to understand, like, let it be what it is. It's not, not a logical thing that you're trying to do. Yeah. And it's like, when I said that, she's like, oh, I think, I think that's what I need to hear. So she could be at peace with, you know, scratching and clawing to get this money to spend on the wedding. Like, don't think of it as an investment. Is this a logical investment? No, that's not the point. Right. right. And so a lot of my conversations with folks end up being that not like what mutual fund is going to give us the best return. Like yeah. nobody cares about that. Yeah. It's what do I need to do to make sure I'm going to be okay. Right. Yeah. And you've obviously you've had a lot of clients too over the years where they, you know, maybe they've started out as clients and it's been like a very, you know, uh, well, I don't want to say generic relationship, but then all of a sudden you get, they get the diagnosis or they get the, the spouse dies. And then suddenly like you're now walking through in a lot of ways you become their therapist. Too. Well, so I've had, um, several <laughs> people that say, man, you're almost like my therapist. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. in some ways kind of the job, but, uh, I had one lady who told me, um, after her divorce, she's like, you've been more helpful in helping me process all this and move on than my therapist has. Wow. So. Wow. Okay. So I, well, I mean, I really love that perspective and, and just the way that you, um, really do approach your business as a financial advisor in a way that you, I mean, yes, you're in this business to make money, but you also genuinely care about your clients and you make that evident in so many ways where you're not going to recommend to them some plan that doesn't actually make sense to the, to, you know, for them, even if like a certain plan would make you more money, like you're not going to do that. Like you genuinely, create plans and make suggestions based on what is going to actually be in their best interest. And, um, was that something that was just always like, just who you are as a person? Was that more learned or how did you begin to really adopt that mindset? Also seeing it in sort of the what's the, I guess, like kind of like the long game of, um, there's, I mean, I, I can think of a, a couple that we know that, like they're not even clients of yours, but you've given them advice and things over the years. And then they've referred more clients than almost anybody else. And so it's like, but you never started out with the intention of, oh, I'm going to make money off of these people. Does that make yeah. sense? Well, so a lot of people in the financial advisory world really approach it as a sales job. Right. Which 
the way that a lot of businesses are set up, it kind of is like if you're dealing with a, I won't mention any specific names, but like big financial firms, like names that you would recognize that have, you know, their brands on stadiums and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you are essentially dealing with a salesperson yeah. um, who doesn't have a lot of control over having the ability to give you like real advice because they're being told, Hey, you got to push this stuff. Like these are the funds that you can use in people's accounts and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's a conflict of interest issue right, right there. Um, but anytime you're approaching things from a sales mindset, there's a lot of, like quote unquote sales gurus out there, some of which are good and some of them aren't at all. And when you get in this mindset of, I want to be the guy who can sell ice to Eskimos sales mentality, then you're just, you're peddling a product. Right. And it doesn't matter what business you're in. Like that's not what the person needs. Yeah. Like being a truly, there's a reason that sales people like as a profession have a bad reputation, right? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, so even when I was in radio, there were people where, yeah, I could have sold commercials to them, but I could talk to them for 10 minutes and realize, yeah, our station's not a good fit for them. Right. And I, <laughs> there were a couple of people where I told them that. I was like, yeah, I think you'd be better off to do something else with this marketing money. And I think they're blown away by that. But I was just like, I'm not interested in trying to sell you something that I know is not what you need. Yeah. So it wasn't really just in this business. It's just like a mindset in general. Like, I don't I don't need to be the guy who can sell ice to Eskimos. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really, really good perspective. And I think that that, you know, again, speaks to your integrity. And um, when we're recording this last night, we had a your your Christmas party for your clients. And uh, I was laughing this morning with you just talking about how one of the people that was in attendance of your Christmas party with your clients is your compliance guy, who's mm -hmm. just the best. We we love him because he's British, but he's an American citizen now. And uh, he's just, he's brilliant. He's brilliant. We love yep. him. And top five favorite person. He really is just the best. And I said, I mean, how many financial advisors have their compliance guy at their Christmas party? But then he came up to you after and he said a very British choice word that I will not say on the podcast, but he was like, man, your clients really love you. And to see that your compliance guy, the guy that just makes sure you're following all the nitty gritty state rules and regulations nope. was at your party and said, wow, your, your clients really love you. Also, again, there was some more colorful language in there, but um, we love we love him. He's the best. Um, okay, so then on the other side of things is has been your approach to taking care of the people who work for you. And I don't remember the first time you ever talked to me about this, um, where you were just like, I just, part of my motivation for wanting the business to be more successful is not to put more money in my pocket, but to put more money in the pockets of the people that work for me. Can you kind of talk about like, where did that mindset came from and how you really see value in, in that? I don't know where it came from necessarily. I've always kind of liked to be the person taking care of people, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. which I think probably you wouldn't spend time talking to me and be like, oh, he's a really caring guy. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> but, yeah. But I do like to be the, and maybe it's an ego thing. I don't know. Um, we can just, psychoanalyze just like you right here on the show. being the guy who, hey, you really took care of me, you know? Yeah. So that's part of it. But also there's just a very clear black and white, like the people that, take care of you, you take care of them and vice versa. I mean, it's right. not, it's, it's a business decision too. It's not just like, yeah. let me be as charitable as I can be. It's, it's like your people are an investment, right? Yeah. So, um, I'll use another Cody quote. Congrats, Cody. You got quoted twice on here. And, <laughs> and so we'll think, uh, in terms of employees, not just the financial business, but also the media company, cause we have more people there. And, you know, it's been a challenge over the years trying to find the things that will motivate different people. Yeah. Like some people are very motivated by bonuses or raises or whatever. And other people are more motivated by just a better work environment. Right. Kind of thing. 
flexibility of hours and stuff like that. And so Cody had said one time, he's like, look, you can't go into trying to motivate employees by just making everything a bonus plan. And if we hit these marks, everybody gets these bonuses. He's like, because if people were motivated by that in the same way that you are, then they would not be working for somebody. They would just own their own business. Yeah. And that was a big revelation for me where it's like, oh, you're right. Not everybody thinks like me. Not everybody's motivated the same way I am. So you kind of have to learn how to see what is it that's really going to make this person happy and make this person motivated to continually get better at their job. Right. And for some people, it's financial incentives. And for some people, it just isn't at all. Yeah. So what has that? Yeah, because I think, I mean, for people that don't know, you also co-own a media company, which you kind of alluded to at the beginning, but um, who produces the show. So shout out to Grace, who is one of your awesome uh, employees and um, on the media side of, of things. Well, and so Grace is a great example of like, I don't know if we know she's been around for two or three years at this point. Yeah. I don't know if we know yet necessarily what Grace's ultimate motivation is. Maybe she doesn't know. Grace, you can email me. Yeah. If you yeah, have Grace, any thoughts. You're, you're listening to this right she now. She just so. bought a house. Congrats, Grace. Yeah. But she's a good example of like, I don't think, again, Grace, you can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I don't think that an aggressive bonus structure, if we hit certain revenue goals, is what's going to get her excited. Yeah. Probably something else. Yeah. And I mean, I think about, I remember uh, you told me, like, we're just calling out all the third wheel employees right now. But like, I remember a couple years ago, like Dan, who's been at third wheel forever and Dan's occasionally produces the show too. But um, you guys had sat down with Dan and you were like, you know, what, what would you like? And he was just like, I don't know, the occasional Friday <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. And you guys were like, wait, wait, what, that's it. <laughs> but it was like just having that conversation of like, what do you, yeah, I'd like to be able to work from home some and take an occasional Friday off and just like, but that's, yeah. So, uh, Dan actually started occasionally working from home pre pandemic. Yeah. And I, this is my favorite Dan quote, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but it's funny. So I, uh, texted him, I think, his very first day working from home because that was like a new, exciting thing in 2019. Yeah, or whatever it was like, it was. ooh, somebody's working from home. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I just said, Are you working in your underwear today? <laughs> and he replied immediately without hesitation, Why would I need underwear? <laughs> <laughs> See, that's really what motivates people. Yeah. I mean, that really is what motivates you is that you can step out of your office and pee right in front of it. And yep. Even though there is a toilet steps like 15 steps further. It's not as gratifying. But, you know, anyway. OK, so we've talked about, uh, you know, your approach to your clients, your approach to employees. At this stage of your business where you would, you know, again, you're not running this fortune 500 financial advisory practice but you know this year obviously with the market being what it is but yet you still hit some of your quote unquote goals what is the kind of thing that you at this stage of your business are looking to do long term like what are your long what's your long term vision uh i don't know if i've ever been great with long term stuff because everything changes so much in a year or two yeah. that to me looking out 10 years has never been particularly beneficial. Uh, medium term goal, I think is having another advisor person as opposed to support person, but like another advisor so that if I'm gone or just unavailable for whatever reason, like there's somebody else who can handle the investment advice side of it yeah. um, as opposed to sure. Abby can do whatever paperwork is needed. Um, but somebody who can say, yeah, you know what? All right, if you need $15,000, we should sell this in your account and uh, let's do this and move this here. Somebody else that can do that would be nice just for my own ability to not be so tied to the day-to-day -day yeah. needs of clients. And in terms of adding new clients at this stage, it's just, I don't need any new clients necessarily. And so people are always really worried about like, do you have an account minimum or no? I mean, my criteria is, do I like you and can I legitimately help you? Yeah. And if those two things are true, then you qualify. Yeah. Um, so do I like you? That's pretty self-explanatory and easy to understand. Can I help you is 
I can have a conversation with somebody one time and have a pretty clear picture of, are they going to listen to what I tell them to do or not? Yeah. And if it's pretty clear that they're not, if they're just coming in here because they want me to say, yeah, you're doing everything right, even if they're not, you can usually tell that. And yeah, I'm probably not going to move the ball forward for them to become clients because I know that I'm just going to keep telling them things over and over and over that they're not going to do. And I'm not interested in being the captain of the Titanic. Yeah. Well, th- you saying that reminds me, um, you don't have to obviously say the names of your clients, but you have a couple that you have been working with for a couple of years now and, and you'd met with them, I guess it was maybe like last week and you came in the house after you met with them and you're like, man, I love those guys. They're funny. And they actually listen to what I say. Can you tell that story? Because I think it's a great example of like they're young and they don't necessarily fall into the stereotypical category of like planning for retirement are retired, but they're, they fell into the category of you liked them and you realized you could actually help them. Yeah. So they're just very low maintenance. They'll occasionally email with a question, but they just, they don't get too worried about things. And so, uh, we might not talk, you know, face to face more than once, maybe twice a year. And, you know, I think I had a zoom visit with them last December and I gave them some pretty specific goals for this year, which I do with everybody, but it's so rare that people take those and say, all right, he told us to do these seven things. Let's do them all. Like most people kind of get the principle that I'm trying to get across and like sort of behave in that direction, Yeah. but don't necessarily look at it as a checklist. So anyway, we get together again this December and they've just done everything perfectly, just flawlessly. I'm like, wow, guys, you, the, good job. Like, you're really organized here. They're like, well, we just did exactly what you told us to do. And <laughs> yeah. after you emailed us the summary of our last meeting and said, do this, this, and this, and that's what we did. So I was like, okay, well, <laughs> that's it's still shocking to me to <laughs> see somebody who executes it that well. Yeah, yeah. And now they're, you know, they're a youngish married couple. I see, I think they're young because they're what, like early 40s, late 30s, early 40s, and they're in really great financial shape and really thinking about things long term. So anyway, well, I love you and I really appreciate you. And I think that um, you were the perfect final guest. Are there any like words of wisdom you want to like leave the people with? I feel like if I leave you with words for wi- words of wisdom, then uh, that that would probably be the end of my <laughs> podcast career with yeah. you. And I'd like to show up on the new podcast like occasionally. A, yeah, you'll, you'll get to show up. Yeah. So it's not, I guess I should say, you know, you're, you're still going to be around. I'm not like getting rid of you. So. <laughs> well, the night is young. We'll see. <laughs> Um, but I, I love you and I appreciate you and, uh, thanks for being my guest. Always a pleasure. Um, so for the listeners, here's the deal over the next couple of weeks. So next week, tune in for the final episode of 2022, where I'm going to tell you the new rebranded name of the podcast, what things are going to look like going forward. And then for the first time, In six and a half years, I'm going to take a single week off. So the first Wednesday of 2023, there will be no new podcast that week. But don't like unsubscribe. Don't go away. I'm like afraid to take one single week off, but I'm going to give myself that break, that freedom of one single week. So here's a hint about unsubscribing. Uh, Nobody is going to say, wait, that didn't show up in my feed this week. I'm done. I'm unsubscribing. (laughs) The way that unsubscribing works is when you start putting out a bunch of stuff that sucks Mm. and then people say, oh, this isn't really worth Mm. my time anymore. I think I would like for this to stop showing up in my feed. I see. So I feel pretty good about your week off being okay. Yeah, being okay. So, but it'll be the first time I've done it in six and a half years. Yeah. So, uh, but I, you know, I, what are you going to do with your time? I well finish my manuscript of my mm. book. And that is honestly the biggest reason why. <laughs> so, um, but I just wanted to give you a heads up as to that is what's coming. And then the second week of January, get excited because we'll be launching, relaunching, however we want to really word this, uh, the new podcast, but we'll share all the details next week. And, uh, Thanks for, thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. 
I hope you loved this episode with my husband, John. It was so much fun to do. And I mean, I just, again, maybe I'm a little biased, but I think he's pretty great. And I really love his perspective on business and running a business and how he works with his clients and how he treats his clients and how he sees his business as an opportunity to really, you know, make a positive impact and to change people's lives. I would love to know what you loved about this episode. Would you let us know on social media? You can find me at Still Being Molly or at Business with Purpose Podcast, and you can use the hashtag Business with Purpose Podcast. And like I said, be sure to tune in next week where I will have the episode that reveals the new name of the podcast and what the show is going to look like going forward. I'm really excited and I hope you are too. Make sure that whatever podcast platform you are listening to this on right now, make sure you click that subscribe or follow button. Clicking that button helps to make sure that you will never miss an episode, even when the rebrand happens. So uh, be sure to click that subscribe or follow button. Leave us a review. And like I mentioned in the episode with John, I'm actually going to, for the first time in six and a half years, going to be taking a week off that first week of January, just to give myself a little bit of breathing room to get, make sure everything is ready to go for the relaunch of the podcast the second week of January. So, but if, like I said, if you're, if you're subscribed to the podcast at that time, no worries because it will drop right into your feed when the new episode launches. So we will see you next week. And as always, I want to thank the team at third wheel media for producing the show and for you go do something good with purpose on purpose. Purpose.